Pictures are a British independent film company based in Devon. And for those of you that don't know what a director of photography does, I will use my dad's definition to demonstrate. According to my dear dad, a director of photography is someone that does this with their hands, <laughs> frames up a shot, and then tells their camera operator to shoot it while they go and get coffee. My job is slightly more complex than that. According to good old Wikipedia, I am the person who is responsible for achieving artistic and technical decisions related to the image. Now, that's closer to what I believe I think I do, but it still sounds quite cold. So I prefer this guy's version. Some of you might know him. His name's Orson Welles, and he's awesome. And I think he really hits the nail on the head when he says, a film is never really good unless the camera is an eye in the head of a poet. No pressure there, Orson, thanks. Apparently I'm also a poet now. And today we're going to be hearing about all kinds of storytelling. I'm going to be talking about visual storytelling. Film as an art form is fairly young, but visual storytelling has been around for thousands of years, ever since we started painting on the side of our caves. So I'm going to start with a quick example of how powerful visual storytelling can be. Who can tell me what that is? Flower. It's a flower. So let's think about what's just happened. I've put a picture of a flower on the wall. <coughs> I went into my garden and light that left the sun over eight minutes ago bounced off that flower into my eye and allowed me to see it. I grabbed my camera and I took a photo of it and the camera has also captured that light and converted it into digital information. I took that digital information, I put it into this presentation, I brought it here today and the guys have run it through the projector. The projector then converted it back into light information and projected it onto the screen behind us. That has then been reflected into your eyes and you recognise that image. You recognised it as a thing that bees fly into, that grows in the light, that smells nice. But then when you realised you had to communicate that, that image and convert it into a word, a different part of your brain kicked in, the Broca's area, I believe, according to Google. And you had to take that image and the ideas and the feelings that were created and translate it into an English word, flower. <coughs> now, I could have made things easy for you. I could have just shown you this. But that doesn't really look as pretty and it definitely doesn't give us as much information about the flower. It doesn't tell us what colour it is, what time of day that photo was taken or even if the flower is alive or dead. But the picture of the flower can be understood by nearly anyone in any country at nearly any point throughout history. The word flower is limited to those of us that speak modern English. Now that leaves about four and a half billion people on this earth that wouldn't know what that is. But I'm pretty sure most people could tell me what that was. Now I'm heard you, sure you've heard the uh, expression, a picture says a thousand words. And interestingly, in terms of digital information, that picture of a flower is 6,532 times bigger or larger than the six letter word flower. But we process that image so much quicker than we do the word. And that is how well wired we are to receive a visual input. In fact, our entire lives are one continuous stream of audio and visual information. Even when we go to sleep, we dream in sounds and pictures. Without light, it's quite obvious to say, but we wouldn't have a picture. But just think about how much we base our lives around it. The sun was our first god, and without it, not only would we be blind and hungry, but we wouldn't even exist in the first place. Light even plays a huge part on our subconscious. When the sun is out and we are, it's bright, we're happy. When the sun goes down, we're reflective. When the sun comes up in the morning, we're inspired. And when we go to bed at night, we're scared. We're scared of the dark and the sun goes away. And it seems obvious to say that without light, we couldn't make a film. But by simply having enough light to expose a scene isn't enough to make movie magic. Let me give you an example using a famous poem. <clears throat> A man walks through a field and he stops and sees some flowers underneath a tree by a lake. It's a good poem, right? <laughs> no? Now, you see, I don't understand this because the words are there. They're all 
written correctly, and I spell checked them using my husband last night. But it just doesn't sound that great. I mean, I even stole the original content from a famous uh, poet, this guy. Anyone know who that is? It's Wordsworth. And his original version was absolutely fantastic. I'll read it to you. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, beneath, beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Now, I don't know about you, but I think they both sound the same. Like, there's no difference. <laughs> Mine's really good, right? No, it's not. Wordsworth's original poem has lasted over 200 years. And I'm pretty sure if you haven't already, you would have forgotten my version for lunchtime. The difference between these two poems, the reason why one is dull and one is elegant, is creativity, is soul. It's the words that have been sculpted and designed to evoke emotion. Going beyond correct, sufficient and functional is not enough. That's the difference between writing and creative writing. And as a visual storyteller, I do exactly the same thing. I just don't use words, I use other tools. I use the camera and the light. But we don't expect writers to just grab a load of words and slap them onto a piece of paper and call that a story. And in the same way, I can't just turn on any old light and expect to make an image look good. In fact, if I light a scene badly, it doesn't matter how good the actor is, the costume is, or the set, I can really mess things up. There's one thing that I can do and that's light seen creatively. And with the knowledge of how to do that, we can make some real movie magic. And that's what Orson Welles was talking about when he says, a film is never really any good unless the camera is an eye in the head of a poet. So we're gonna take a look at some great examples of how creative lighting has been used in some scenes that you guys might be familiar with. Does anyone know this one? No, oh my God, wow, okay. Wow, <laughs> right crowd. Nosferatu. The use of shadows in this scene is what really appeals to me. Nosferatu is one of, I would say, the original scary horror films, and shadows have still been used to this day in horror films. And why? Why are shadows used in this effect? Well, we all know how to kill a vampire, right? You stick a stake in its heart, you cut off his head, you burn him at stake, put him in the sunlight. You can't do that with a shadow. Well, you can put it in the sunlight, but that's really the point. Shadows are untouchable. You can't hurt them yet they're still coming to get you. They're still creeping up the stairs. Next one. It's quite easy, that one. It's The Godfather. Now, when I first started learning about photography, I picked up on one thing really quickly, and that was eye light. As photographers, and as probably some of you in the audience, we always try and put a little bit of light in our subject's eyes. This is because they say that the eyes are the window to the soul. And by putting a little bit of light in there, we evoke some spirit. We make the character seem alive. In this example, by using top lighting, that's where we shine a light right down, which I was a little bit scared that's going to happen here, but it seems really well lit, so it's fine. The light hits the top of his brow and forces his eyes to become dark and mysterious. We can't see into his soul. We can't connect with that character. He seems remote and emotionless, which is, of course, the character that Marlon Brando is playing in The Godfather. More tricky, this one. Oh, damn it. <laughs> yeah, okay, this is Kill Bill. This is actually part of an extended fight scene. Uh, but this part in particular is my favorite fight scene of all time. Um, it's really weird, actually. The film that we were just seeing before this is the reason why I love this shot so much. And it's because it reminds me of the old storytelling technique of shadow puppets, where they had a silk screen and they shone a bright light behind it. And what it does is it forces you to focus on the movement. You can't see the gore, you can't see the aggression in people's faces. You're forced to focus on the choreography, the fantastic fight choreography, and let's face it, the absolute kick-ass moves of the lead actress. Gladiator. I was hoping someone would say Zombies. I don't know if any of you have seen it. But it's the first film I ever shot with round pictures and we kind of ripped this scene off. But <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. It's a powerful image nonetheless. <clears throat> the reason why this one is one of my favourite shots from the film Gladiator is the use of the sunlight. Now, I spoke earlier about what happens when the sun sets. We become reflective. 
And what happens when the sun sets? It becomes dark. In this scene, the main character, Maximus, is walking towards the darkness. And I think I might ruin it for those of you who haven't actually seen it. But Maximus is actually dying. This is a metaphor. In the film, Gladiator, uh, that Maximus is dying, and the use of this light is a metaphor for the fact that he's walking into the darkness. And the fact that we're even pointing into the light not only means that we get these fantastic lens flares, which I absolutely love, but it, every single piece of that corn in that field is backlit, making the field seem really deep. He's got a long way to go before he reaches it, but he is going to get there. So as you can see, by using creative lighting, it doesn't just impact our perception of the scene or the mood, but by sculpting that light onto a character, we can actually change the way that we perceive them. <clears throat> Everyone actually is uh, taught a particular trick from this toolkit. Uh, it's usually reserved for ghost stories when you're sat around a campfire, but it's this one. And it's really scary. I'm sure most of you have done this, right? Even as kids. And the reason why this is scary is, is because we're not used to seeing people lit from below. Light bulbs are in the ceiling, right? Not on the floor. When we put a light underneath someone's chin, we create these really weird shadows. If you imagine that you're an absolutely giant monster that's just stumbled on these kids that are around the campfire, this is how you will be perceived. The light is below you. You will look scary and imposing. It's a fantastic little trick. I love that one, except when I blind myself in front of 100 people. But it's all very well to show you a picture of something scary and tell you, oh, it's the lighting that's making that scary. If I show you a picture of a vampire, you're supposed to be scared. We all know that we're supposed to be scared of vampires. <coughs> or at least I did until the Twilight series came out. And I don't know if I'm supposed to be in love with them or hate them or what. But in practice, most films are a collaboration of a load of artists working together for one director and one vision. So it's really difficult to divorce the lighting from everything else that's going on. When I first, first started learning about editing, I was shown a really great example of the power of the cut, demonstrated by the grandfather of editing, Sergei Eisenstein. And what Eisenstein did was he took a performance by an actor who was looking desperate, and he intercut it with a bowl of soup. And the result? A man who looked hungry, desperate to eat. But then he took exactly the same performance from the same actor and intercut it with a woman sat by a grave. And the result? A sad man, desperate to comfort that woman. At the time, audience thought that they had seen two separate performances and praised them for their subtlety. So I wanted to conclude today by trying to find a similar scientific example to prove my point about lighting. The next two images you are about to see are the same actor, the same props, the same costume, the same location, the same camera, the same lens. I even used the exact same three lights. The only things I changed were the position and the colour. Let's have a look at the first one. Hmm. This is what we call high key lighting. Things like Friends or toothpaste commercials or most Richard Curtis movies are shot like this. Very bright, very colourful. There's no areas of deep shadow where things could be lurking. This style of shooting generally conveys warm, fuzzy, safe feelings. All the lights are on. There could possibly be a fire on in the lounge, that's creeping, the light that's creeping through the door. And we can clearly see that that guy's wearing a coat. It's obviously cold outside, but he's come home and he's carrying a bottle of wine. Judging by the flower petals that are scattered on the stairs and the fact that those candles are lit, looks like he's in for a pretty awesome romantic night, right? I don't know why, that's actually my husband. <laughs> <laughs> and, I'm <laughs> and I'm behind the camera, so <laughs> I don't know where he thinks he's going. This is the second version. This is classic low-key stuff. Lots of harsh shadows. Lots of contrast. The warm orange light that we saw previously has been replaced by cold, harsh blue moonlight. The shadow on the stairs is kind of reminiscent of that scene we saw from Nosferatu earlier. And we can't even see what he's holding in his hand, really. It could be a knife. Or, if you look at the shadow on the wall, which you can't see because the image has been cropped out, I promise you it looks like a gun. <laughs> I worked very hard to make that happen. <laughs> and the only rich, warm colour that's left in this scene is the foreboding blood red of the curtain at the top of the stairs, where that guy's heading. And before anyone says that I changed the scene by blowing out the candles, candles are still lights, and it's my department and it's my rules, so no arguing. <laughs> 
So not only have we managed to change the mood and the shot just by moving the lighting around, but we have completely changed the implications and the motives of the scene. This is a pretty extreme example, and it really only just scratches the surface of what we are able to achieve with creative lighting. There are so many more variables than position and colour. So I'm going to put it to you guys. Next time you are in a place that is beautiful, or somewhere that is scary, or somewhere that makes you feel cosy, or somewhere that is awe-inspiring, just take a moment and look around. Now, I'm willing to place good money that lighting is playing a big part of how you are feeling. And let's face it, without light, the world would be a pretty dark place. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>